Hey, it's Aaron, the Metal Theologian. All right, so we have a topic today, all right? But first things first, because we're going to enjoy something together today, and here's what it is. All right, so, <laughs> as you probably know, uh, the records that I get the most excited about tend to be the private pressings. You know, like a little label here and there, especially, I mean, it, it's kind of hard to draw the line between a private pressing and a tiny label when a label is sort of small beyond a certain point. But without getting into any of that, this is the shit you search, that, that I really sort of search out. The shit where, you know, I'm most likely to just sort of roll the dice if I just sort of see something randomly in a shop or whatever. It goes up based on the cover. Well, out of all of the heavy metal records out there, there's really kind of one that's known for being the most infamous uh, among people who are into this shit. Probably, the, the, the only one that I think can compete with it really is the Medieval Sorcery record, because that one has a reputation of being really shitty. And actually, let me show that real quick. Because I talked about this one once before. I gotta grab it off the shelf here. Yeah, here it is. All right, so this one is kind of known for like, first of all, the way it looks like no one's ever sure if they're called Dark Ages or Medieval Sorcery. The band is actually Medieval Sorcery and the record is called Dark Ages. I talked about this, I don't know, a year or two ago, something like that, because I sort of rolled the dice on it and I actually liked it more than I expected to. You know, what can I say? Um... So shit, today might be a little bit more of a continuation of that than I realized. Okay, but this only gets the number two spot because people kind of know about this one. If there's one private press heavy metal record that's out there in circulation where people go, oh, fuck, stay away from that one, man, because the cover, it's suckering you in. The thing is a piece of shit. It's not heavy. It's all wimpy and it's fucking terrible. Well, I rolled the dice on it. And this is it right here. Um, and it's not an expensive record because people know, right? But uh, I hold in my hand the Shores of Evening record. All right. I don't know if anyone but Alan from Let's Talk Metal is cringing really hard right now, but I guarantee you that he is. Um, yeah, so we're going to listen to this together while we go into the topic. See, it has like that cover, like the drawing's all shitty. You know, it looks perfect, right? I mean, this looks like... It should be a fucking banger, you know? And, um... I mean, I actually sampled this a little bit because it came up kind of cheap, and I was, I, was, I paid like 20 bucks for this thing, okay? So not like a fuckload of money or anything. And, um... I was sort of like, you know, I don't want to be a total sucker. But, um... You know, I, I kind of like shit. You know, I kind of like things that suck. And I was like, you know... <laughs> what am I waiting for? <laughs> it's cheaper than, like, the new, like, creator record or something like that, where I already have a bunch of records by them and don't really need any more. And this record's kind of crap, all right? But it kind of has its moments, too. Like, this intro is god-awful. I'm not going to try and defend this shit, right? This is, like... This could be an intro of an Ario Speedwagon record. So there you got, it got a little distortion on the guitar. Yeah, so I'm not gonna spend the whole time talking about Shores of Evening. Um, but we are gonna listen to it while we're talking about the actual subject at hand because, uh, because I just live to antagonize my audience with shitty records. Um, and, and yeah, I, let me tell you my favorite thing about this is, listen, that's not that bad. There's some like weird like synth thing or something going on in there. I don't know if you're going to really hear it on the recording, I can't quite tell what it is, but yeah, I don't know man. So anyway, my favorite thing about this, other than the cover, because the cover is just, I mean, it's a 10 out of 10, right? I mean, even the logos kind of sucks, right? But the band is called Shores of Evening, and the album title is The Shore of Evening. Um, and I know someone is going to say, oh, wait a minute, isn't that a plural name, so it's not really metal? Dude, 
you're not going to really make much of a counter argument on the strength of this record, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I'm also going to be enjoying this cheer wine, by the way, while we're uh, doing it. i got the glass bottles. I sprung for these last time my kid, Spencer, actually. Last time he was in town, and he didn't finish them, so I'm going to right now. That was my mounted bottle opener that I just used, by the way, which is right mm -hmm. there on the side of the record cubes. I'd be willing to bet that this is the only channel in the vinyl community, the very least in the heavy metal vinyl community, with a bottle opener mounted on the side of the record cubes. I wouldn't be surprised if Dennis from uh, Analog Archives had one mounted on the side. He just, I could, I could see that. All right, so uh, last like Friday or something, Chromie D came out with a video, and he was talking about um, thrash records. Like, and it was just like a laid back video. It was a really fun video. If you're not subscribed to Chromium Dioxide Radio, go do it. It's like <laughs> I want to say it's like my channel with puppets, but it's actually not. It's like a ton of lore, much faster pace. Like the banter is so fast, you have to like rewind sometimes and shit. And, just a really fun channel, though. And when he gets into the lore, man, it goes way the fuck off the deep end. So this is just like a casual sort of talking about records type of video. They're all about records, but some have more lore than others. And this one was mostly just records. And the topic was thrash records, and he pulled out seven, actually, of his favorites. And I was like, man, every one of these records is either so fucking good or else um, one that I just haven't really spent as much time with as it probably deserves. So I'm going to pull them all out and fucking reassess and listen to them again. And some of these I don't necessarily feel like I've sort of internalized all that much yet. Some of these I'm still sort of working on it. The synth and the guitar like alternating. This is 85 by the way in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> this is really... Like, I totally see why someone would have bought this fucking record and felt completely ripped off. But I knew what I was getting myself into. And I gotta be honest, I don't feel ripped off at all. I feel amused and entertained. Alright, so anyway, I really just showed this the last time, but uh, these aren't in the same order that Chromie D did them, but I'm gonna just talk about the same records here. So I'm gonna get this one out of the way because I talk about this one kind of a lot anyway, but Onslaught, Power From Hell. Now, Chrome. Now, Chromie D has the Puss Mort press, I'm pretty sure it is, with, like, a little bit of coloring in it and shit. I have the Children of the Revolution Records one. We actually got at, um, 101 Music in San Francisco back in the 90s for five bucks. I think it was sealed. This is just an all-time classic fucking great record. This is one of the bands that I got into when I first got into metal. And for some reason, I was gravitated towards Onslaught, even though... I was still religious at the time, and like this kind of imagery tended to kind of intimidate me, like the Slayer and shit like that. I sort of shied away from. But onslaught, I was in on man. This band, I've heard that they were a punk band and then sort of became a metal band, and you can kind of hear that a little bit in the delivery, right? Because the guy has a really sort of a punky singing style. But what it is is really dark, and frankly, his accent adds a lot to it, too. Like, this is one of very few metal records as late as 1985 that benefited from being, you know, English. Because these guys sound it. Um, and, you know, there was still good stuff coming out of the UK in uh, 85, but the second half of the 80s. Well, we're going to talk about a couple more British ones. Anyway... Onslaught. This is just such a fucking great record. It's it's really intense, but there's a real sort of control about it. You know what I mean? Like it's really sort of focused, and has uh, I think maybe last time I said I, this is like a lawful evil record as far as D and D alignments go. There's something about this that's just really focused and so sort of um. It sounds like it's contained. Like it creates a space. And then it lives in that space, and it fills that space, right? But it's sort of within the space that it creates for itself, if that makes sense. Sort of the image that I get with it, you know? 
This record just gets better and better every time I listen to it. Just a great fucking record, man. Power from Hell by Onslaught. All right, here's one that I actually got at Amoeba Hollywood. It was sealed. I think I paid 15 bucks for it. And I didn't know who they were. And for some reason, in spite of the shitty cover, I rolled the dice on it. Probably because... It's... <laughs> actually, I can probably tell you exactly why. Because even though the front cover of this is terrible, and like not good terrible, this just kind of sucks, you know? But the fucking guy is holding an axe. So, you know, he gets a little bit of a break. Anyway, this, these guys are Canadian. It's actually one of the few records I own on the Bonsai label, incidentally. Like, I have most of the shit that Bonsai licensed, or shit that really came out on Bonsai also, but I have very few Bonsai pressings. I think this one and uh, my copy of Swords and Axes by Overdrive are the only ones in my collection. Anyway, the other guy has a machete, by the way, too, but I still gotta give it up for the guy with the axe. Anyway, this record is really pretty ferocious, man. Like, it's a speed metal record, right? Or a thrash record. I'm not so sure there's really much of a difference there. Um, and I've talked about that enough probably at this point, too. But um, this thing just has a ferocity to it, man. It just has, like, um, an intensity. And... Um, I mean, it really sounds kind of wild, you know. I mean, it easily hangs with a Canadian band, like with Canadian bands like you know Razor or Exciter. You know, it's in that. It's probably more like sort of in the sacrifice vein as far as just like intensity goes. You know what I mean? So if you think this is going to be like sort of like a fun little romp, like you know, a band trying to sound like Ride the Lightning or something, this is really a couple steps beyond that. And this is still, I think this record's like '85 or something. I don't remember right off. So this is one that I personally, even though I had it, I kind of snoozed on it for a long time because every time I flip past it, the cover would piss me off, right? It would kind of annoy me, so I guess I'm encouraging you to not make the mistake that I made. Oh, there's got to be a fucking date on here somewhere. 87. Okay, so a little later than I thought. Very good record, though, man. Infernal Majesty. You know, it's not even, you know what almost bothers me more than the shitty cover on this is the umlaut over the A. If you're a metal band, you don't put umlauts over A's. You put them over O's and U's, and that's it, right? Put it over an A, you're probably full of shit. You know, you're probably Spinal Tap or something like that. Yes, I know it was over the N in the Spinal Tap logo, but they were, that was actually a joke. So anyway, yeah. Infernal Majesty, None Shall Defy, fantastic fucking record, man. Alright, so here's one that I'm relatively new to, and like, just relatively new to. I didn't really discover these guys until I got into death metal. But this really is more of a thrash record. In fact, this is totally a thrash record because the way this thing sounds, I'm not sure these guys would have been able to play well enough to execute on good death metal. This one, I don't know that it is so sloppy, but it feels really sort of sloppy, you know? It really kind of sounds like a few kids in their garage, except it's better produced than that, you know what I mean? I mean, it looks about like how they sound, you know? Or it sounds about like what they look like, right? Or what the cover looks like, for that matter. Not really all that intimidating. Like, um, Onslaught and uh, Infernal Majesty are probably more, like, intimidating. These guys are kind of more, like... Like, they're going for it, but it's like, it's like they're doing their best to be intimidating, but like they're 14 years old, so come on. You know what I mean? This is kind of like that, and maybe that sounds like a slight, but this is a really good record. One that I really need to spend more time with myself, you know? Because it brings the speed, it brings the, uh, it brings the grit and the grime, and just sort of the, the youthful exuberance. And uh, yeah, I really dig it a lot. I said we were going to come back to the UK. Yeah, that video Chromie D made was great. That's, that was how I spent my afternoon was listening to the records he pulled out. So, <laughs> Shout out to Chromie D. Yeah, you'd be surprised how recently I got this one. This uh, Sabbath. I, um, I remember at the time I thought Sabbath was a stupid name for a band. And I kind of stand by that, really. And History of a Time to Come wasn't really the kind of record that I was going to go out of my way to find here we go this, this is a wimpy mode this is the kind of shit this record has a reputation for it's a short record so don't worry we're gonna get to listen to the whole thing 
This is really pretty bad right now. But that last song wasn't so bad, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, this record, aside from me, a lot more satanic than it looks. Which is kind of interesting. Um, this one's a lot more vicious than it looks, too, man. You know, it really looks like... You know, this looks like... I think this record's like 88. And this kind of looks like what uh, Testament was going to be doing a couple of years later with, like, the environmental holocaust shit when they were starting to lose their way a little bit. But, um... It's actually really harsh and really rough. And, um... The singer kind of, uh... Alternates between sort of, like, you know, sort of the gruffer, like, type of thrash vocals and, like, the screaming... And when he's doing the gruffer thing, sometimes he makes me sound like... It reminds me of Carnivore, of all bands. I think these guys were probably a lot more serious than Carnivore. The stuff is better put together and better executed. I've had their second record for longer, Dreamweaver. And I probably like this one better because uh, I just appreciate that it's more sort of rough around the edges and more sort of song by song and less sort of high concepts. But Dreamweaver's really good too, so uh, I don't want to shit on it. It's another record I need to spend more time with myself, though, you know? Um, again, for, his, for all the shit that I talk about second half of the 80s in the UK, there were really a few highlights, and this is really kind of one of them, man, so... Shout out to Sabbath. Alright, these guys. I actually got this record at Shackle Records in uh, San Francisco, which hasn't been there in a long time, but... Uh, it was across the street from Amoeba for a while, and I wish them the best. I got a few records there, but there's a metal shop on Hate Street, man. One, you've got to love it, but uh, they didn't last that long. Anyway, Above the Ashes, this is Ulysses Siren. And I believe that what this was originally was just a demo. As far as I know, this is the first and only time it's been put out on LP. Although it's probably overdue to come out again. This is just a 500 run at the time, and I know this hasn't gotten any easier to find. This is really like a lost, like, San Francisco thrash band, you know, almost a thrash masterpiece, you know, it, it really has that sort of Bay Area sound to it, maybe with a little less Bowie production values, but hey, they had less Bowie production values, right? So, like, if you're burned out on Bonded by Blood and uh, The Legacy, you know, and you're tired of your Metallica records, the first three Metallica records, you probably need to hear the Ulysses Siren. Because this is really sort of the one that got away right here. This is a... Yeah, it seems completely arbitrary. That these guys would just sort of be lost to time. And when these other guys that were doing pretty much exactly the same thing would have fared so much better, you know? Not that Exodus and Testament didn't have their ups and downs. Metallic is in a different category, obviously. But these guys were just... Uh... Yeah, they deserve more of a break than they got, I think. Even if the band photo was a little bit... Dated, shall we say. That's what they were all doing, man. You can't hold it against them. Two different recording sessions, it looks like. So maybe this was two demos originally. In any case, it's a fantastic record. Really tops. Gotta flip that bad boy. We've got two more from the Chromie D picks. Well, maybe I'll show one or two more other things here that I've been listening to. Dude, this fucking short is an evening record. Look at this. Even the label looks like it's going to be a winner, right? I mean, doesn't that look like what you want your private press label to look like? Doesn't really sound like what you hope it sounds like, though. To be honest with, that, about, with you about that. I don't know, man. I just like shit sometimes. All right, man, up next is Hobbs' Angel of Death. You know, I bought the uh, reissue of this on uh, High Roller Records because my original love it, the cover's kind of water damaged. Like, every time I pull it out, I kind of gnash my teeth a little bit. I kind of go, ah, oh, God damn it, you know. But when I pulled it out this uh, the other day to listen to it after watching the video, I, um, I noticed this, the um, track listing was reversed on the other one. It's funny that I hadn't noticed that before, because it's not like I've never played this record before. Yeah, 
But yeah, that kind of pissed me off a little bit. I don't know why they do that. There were a couple bonus tracks on the other one too. So I was like, well, goddamn, I gotta talk about the one Chromie he talked about. So I pull up the original press, which is this one. This is an SPV license. I don't know that it ever came out in the States, but it obviously got a European release. And it's 88. These guys are Australian. It's a little bit ridiculous on the back. And this really is, kind of isn't the scariest cover ever, right? But this record is intense, man. It's fucking hardcore. This is like some no bullshit thrash, you know? Like, this is the kind of thrash the death metal fans were, or the death metal bands were listening to and go, we need to one up these guys. How are we going to do it? You know? And so death metal was invented. Because this is really, it has a lot more in common with the likes of Slayer than with the likes of, you know, Anthrax. You know, it really turns it up. And even though they don't look all that serious, and only two of the songs are obviously about Satan, those being Satan's Crusade and Lucifer's Domain. But there's also crucifixion on here. Yeah, it kind of fakes you out a little bit with the look. And with him just kind of looking corny, like... I don't know, like whoever he looks like on the cover, you know? It's such a funny looking painting, man. I wonder what happened to the original. It's probably at the guy's house or something. Hobbs. Peter Hobbs. Yeah. He designed it, so... Anyway, really first-rate shit, man. Don't let this cover fool you, you know? This isn't like Tony McAlpine's fucking solo project or like, uh, you know, one of those other ones where you see the guy's name on it and then, like, a name underneath and you go, oh, yeah, I know what that's gonna be. That's gonna be some shred bullshit. This fucking record is really good. So the last one, this is probably the one I know the least well out of all of these. Because this record is almost like... It's the first Rigor Mortis record. I actually got this on eBay. For a hell of a deal on it, too, incidentally. Yeah, this one's 88. You know what this record sounds like to me? It was if, um, if Grind, instead of coming out of death metal, had come out of thrash metal. You know what I mean? If there hadn't been this, if there weren't that sort of intermediate link between the two. Like, if you imagine... Death metal didn't exist, and someone only had the, was only working with thrash as far as like what to build on top of to invent grind. It would sound kind of like this, you know what I mean? Maybe I can compare it to the Lavatory record from Germany, but that almost sounds dismissive because they're called Lavatory, you know. Um, I don't know, man. Not the most serious record on the planet. But it's not like silly or anything like that either, you know? I don't know if this is ever going to be an all-time favorite of mine, but it's one that I snoozed on for a long time because I thought it looked stupid. You know, a lot of these where I thought it looked stupid or something like that, like, I formed these opinions when I was a kid and I only had so much money to spend. So I'd have to, like, come up with reasons why I didn't really want that one, you know, sort of sour grapes thing. So if I always make a funny face or something I'm explaining that, that's probably why. This record is not one to snooze on, though, and actually, it's staying out for a while because I want to take this one in a couple more times before I put it back on the shelf and hopefully not forget about it again. Yeah, Rigor Mortis, though. The second record has a really stupid cover. I'm not even sure if it's the same band, in fact. So I'm going to stay away from that one, but this one's a banger, man. Um, and it really has something unique about it, too. Like, this one and the Onslaught record, out of the ones I've shown today, really are sound like they sort of exist in their own universe, apart from the whole rest of it, you know? And they're both definitely thrash metal records. But the other ones, like Sabbath and Hobbs' Angel of Death, and what else did I show? I don't even remember now. Even Ulysses' Siren. Definitely Sabbath, Hobbs' Angel of Death, and Infernal Majesty have a lot in common as far as... You know, the approach, the ferocity, the sort of, like, the vibe they're going for. This one and the Onslaught almost exist on their own tiny little islands, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's not like an island way out in the Atlantic. It'd be like, you know, if a couple of the big fra thrash bands were like France and Spain and these guys were Andorra or something like that, you know what I mean? It's like, they know what they're doing. They're not not involved. But they sort of exist out there by themselves and you go, hey, those guys are just a little bit different. I really kind of dig what they're doing. I, I know fuck all about Andorra, so... <clears throat> I don't want to push that analogy too far, but I think you get the point.
This isn't terrible, man. It's just a little bit bad, you know? What else do we have here? I played this one again. <clears throat> it's a great record. A friend of mine uh, who's in a, a local, a friend lives nor locally who's in North Carolina was looking at records and he was like, sent me a picture of this from the record store. I was like, yeah, man, don't snooze on that one. That's a really good... People, like, um, See You in Hell tends to, like, suck all the oxygen out of the room, but this record's a banger in its own right. And I finished texting him back, and I was like, man, I should pull that fucking thing out myself. So, I did. And actually, the funny thing is, uh, apparently he kind of, like, on exactly the same principle, like, not having money, so coming with reasons why he didn't really want that record anyway... Apparently Nick Bocott did a whole bunch of like promos for like guitars or shit like that. Like he did like brand deals and shit. And I don't know how any of that stuff worked. I don't really care. But uh, and, I, and I wasn't aware of that shit at the time. But that kind of put him off. So that was his reason why he never really paid much attention to Grim Reaper. And I'm like, I can relate, man. Anyway, really cool record. This one tends to be a lot cheaper than the first one too. So don't snooze on it next time you see it in the shop for 15 bucks or whatever. Yeah, the last one we're going to talk about today, I think, unless something else jumps out at me here, but um, I've kind of been struggling with this band Dark Horror a little bit. Because, like, some people I know and really like in the community here, greetings to Heavy Metallurgy, really love this first Dark Horror record. I feel like I've been missing something on this record. Like, the singer sounds really weird and really kind of cringe, frankly. It makes it a little bit hard to listen to. But I refuse to be, like... I refuse to be daunted by a fucking singer. You know, it's just, I'm just not willing to let that happen. Especially not when they're going for it. You know, if they're like lazy, you know, that's one thing. But this guy's, this guy's doing his fucking best. And I salute him for that. You know what I mean? This one's kind of grown on me a little bit with time. But it kind of seems like there are two Dark Quarter camps. There are the ones which I've met more recently, frankly, who like that one. And then there are the other ones who prefer the second one, the Etruscan Prophecy. This one actually just came in the mail today. I think I might be in the Etruscan Prophecy camp. Because this one I put on and pretty much liked right away. Now, it's not as heavy as that first one. And it's probably better produced. But it just feels like... It feels like it's put together better. You, you know, and it's almost... And it's not like the pieces are so different... There's nothing specific that I can point to on this one that isn't also on the first one. This one probably has more mellow parts, like acoustics and shit like that. But it almost feels like they're both... It's almost like if you bought two different uh, two different model airplanes, right? The exact same one. And on one you use, like, really, like, fucking Elmer's glue or something. And on the other one you use, like, proper, like, airplane glue, like, and built it to the thing right. It's like they're both working with the same materials, but the one just feels more solidly put together than the other one, which is kind of rickety and ready to fall apart at any minute. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I might be in the Etruscan Prophecy camp. I reserve the right to change my mind on this. Just like with every other fucking record, right? But, um, yeah, and of course, neither is as good as the Mighty Shores of Evening. No, I'm just kidding. Any Dark Quarter record blows like Shores of Evening. But you know something? Now you know that if you've hung in there this long. Because we've made it almost to the end. In fact, I'll find one more record to talk about just so y'all could enjoy the last few notes of this fucking Shores of Evening record. Here's another one I pulled out, man. It's not always just the obscure shit around here. Fucking First Metal Church. I was like, yeah, I haven't played that one in a while. Here's so I'm gonna go ahead and flex up this a little bit. Yeah, you can check out the label on this guy. That's right. The original press. I actually have an Electra on the shelf too. Yeah, this is another record I totally snoozed on when it came out. This is another one because of the name. I don't know, maybe the seeds were there. Because the, the name Metal Church I thought was stupid. And I still do now. Like, 
not quite 40 years later, but we're getting there. But uh, Onslaught, I was always going to be down with a band called Onslaught. All right, well, we made it. If you've hung in there this long, you've listened to the entire Shores of Evening record. And I expect the prices on this to be going up shortly because you're all going to run out and fucking buy your own copies, right? Actually, if even one person goes out and buys a copy of the Shores of Evening record after listening to it here today, I'll be fucking shocked. Because <laughs> it really is kind of a turd and it kind of deserves its reputation. But it doesn't deserve its reputation that much. It's not that bad, man. There's some little things there you can totally make me smile, man. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for enduring. <laughs> And maybe I'll see you on Saturday at the sale. It's going to be... Ah, I talked about that in the short video. Take care. Thanks as always for watching. I do appreciate it.